Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to join the Dreaming New Worlds in Children's and YA Fiction panel at Virtuous Con. We're so happy to have you. And um, I want to start this panel, this amazing panel of authors. And um, ironically, I have at least one book from everybody on this panel. You can't really see it because there's a lot of books here. <laughs> But I have at least one book from everybody. Zeta, I don't know. I think I have maybe six or seven because you're so kind and send me them. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, um, I want to get into it. Um, my name is B. Sharice Moore, and I will be your host today. And our esteemed panel of award-winning, best-selling children's book authors will be sharing the inspiration behind their latest works and what drives them to create fantastic stories that center both the joy and the challenges of being a black child in a world despite an environment that seems increasingly intolerant of diverse narratives. So again, thank you all for coming. And I'd like for you all to put your questions in the Q&A section for our Q&A section later on, please put those in the chat because I'm going to make as much time as I possibly can for your questions. They are very, very important to the panel and very important for the authors to answer them. So I want to start with our bios and I'm going to start with Christine Taylor Butler. All right, Christine Taylor Butler has authored more than 95 books for children including her middle grade series, The Lost Tribes, from Move Books, Charles Bridge, and three titles in Chelsea Clinton's Save The series from Philomel Penguin Random House. A graduate of MIT, she holds degrees in both civil engineering and art and design. In addition to her books, Christine has written a number of articles on the need for diversity in children's publishing, including When Failure is Not an Option, the Horn Book, November, December, 2021. She has spoken at the American Library Association, National Council of Teachers of English, International Literacy Association, as well as numerous world science fiction conventions, World Fantasy, Bascon, and the Nebula Awards. She served as a judge for the Society of Midland Authors Children's Nonfiction Award, the inaugural Walter Dean Myers Children's Literature Award, and PEN America's Phyllis Naylor Working Writer Fellowship. Christine is past president of the Missouri Writers Guild, emeritus board member of Kindling Words, a member of the Kansas City Science Fiction and Fantasy Society, and a director at large of Science Fiction Writers of America, SFWA. In 2021, Christine was named Toastmaster for the World Fantasy Convention in Montreal, Canada. She lives in Kansas City, Missouri. So welcome, Christine Taylor Butler. Thank you. All right, next up, we have Kaylin Barron. Kaylin, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? That's perfect. Okay, great. Kaylin Barron is the New York Times and indie best-selling author of the YA fantasy novel, Cinderella is Dead and This Poison Heart. Her latest works include the YA fantasy, This Wicked Fate, and the middle grade paranormal adventure, The Vanquishers. She is a Sillip Carnaby Medal, Medal nominee, a three-time Sybilis, Sybil, excuse me, C-Y-B-I-L-S award nominee, a Locus Award finalist, and the recipient of the 2022 Randall Keenan Award for Black LGBTQ Fiction. She is a classically trained vocalist and musical theater enthusiast. When she's not writing, you can find her watching scary movies and spending time with her family. Please welcome Kaylin Barron. Next, we have Jerry Craft. Jerry Craft is the New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of the graphic novels New Kid and Class Act. New Kid is the only book in history to win the John Newberry Medal for the most outstanding contribution to children's literature 2020 the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers Literature 2019, and the Coretta Scott King Author Award for the Most Outstanding Work by an African-American Writer 2020. Jerry was born in Harlem and grew up in the Washington Heights section of New York City. Welcome, Jerry Craft. Zeta Elliott is our next author. Zeta Elliott is the author of over 40 books for young readers, including the award-winning picture books, Bird, Melina's Jubilee, and A Place Inside of Me. 
Dragons in a Bag, a middle grade fantasy novel, was named an American Library Association Notable Children's Book and was selected for the 2021 Global Read Aloud. The sequel, The Dragon Thief, was named one of the best books of 2019 by the Cooperative Children's Book Center. Her young adult poetry collection, Say Her Name, was named a 2020 Best of the Best title by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and was nominated for the YALSA Excellence in Nonfiction Award. Her verse novel, Moonwalking, made the 2023 Notable Books for a Global, Global Society list. Her own imprint, Rosetta Press, generates culturally relevant stories that center children who have been marginalized, misrepresented, and are rendered invisible in traditional children's literature. Elliot is an advocate for greater diversity and equity in publishing. She currently lives in Chicago, Illinois. All right, thank you everyone. Fantastic, fantastic bios. Um, I want to start with my first question. Um, and this question is, uh, I think it's a great question because um, oftentimes there's blurred lines between what constitutes middle grade YA chapter books, all right? So I'm gonna start with Christine. And Christine, I have uh, the question here is, what's the difference between chapter books, middle grade and YA? Oh, okay. So <laughs> really that's a cataloging issue for libraries and schools. So, <laughs> So there's some people who call novels chapter books because they have chapters, but I tend to simplify it by saying chapter books are more um, like a Junie B. Jones. They're, they're, um, they're much shorter text. They tend to have black and white illustrations on the inside and, and they're meant for um, younger readers who are kind of emerging into novels. Middle grade kids, upper elementary tend to read up, though I'll tell you the dirty secret, which is a lot of adults read middle grade. That's why some books come out with <laughs> more than one cover. Um, and then YA can get into some stickier issues that middle grade cannot. So the best example I would say is a middle grade book that came out years ago about an 11 year old in human um, uh, uh, child mutilation, you know, she had to go back to Africa and the librarians had to put it in the YA section because of the content, not the age of the protagonist. So is that as clear as mud? No, that, that is, no, that's, that's great. Um, Kayla, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I mean, that really sums it up. Christine summed it up perfectly. I think those are the differences. Um, and I do, I do, um, I think that chapter books um, are fascinating and I would love to write one myself one day. So, but I agree with everything Christine said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Zeta, I wanted to ask you about word count. Because one of the things that I'm I'm noticing is um, specifically in middle grade, all of a sudden I'm seeing these tomes that are like middle grade. And um, I had a conversation with a, another author who told me that as she shared that word count was directly connected with um, advance. And so I wanted to ask first, and I'll, I'll pose this question to the rest of you as well. Um, how do how do you all toe that line between satisfying the demands of your publisher, but also keeping reluctant readers in mind? As a former educator, I will tell you that a child sees a big book. I don't care how wonderful the cover, I don't care how compelling the first page might be. They're like, no, <laughs> this has 400 pages. <laughs> and you know, sometimes adults, we, we kind of like, we kind of trick, you know, I don't know. I, I think we're not really honest. We were saying, oh no, they're gonna get into it. They're gonna love it. No, if we're talking about a reluctant, a reluctant reader, then a lot of times they see that spine and no matter how engaged they may be in the first few pages, um, they may not have the confidence to finish it. So what do you think about that, Zeta? Ooh, well, I think most publishers are not that interested in reluctant readers. <laughs> I think that's the truth. And they are in general marketing to a single audience, which is middle-class white readers. Uh, and there is an expectation that 
if you are interested in reading particularly fantasy that you have an expectation of a large book and a long sort of epic narrative. And I think that's really unfortunate because I certainly have read a number of lengthy books that were under edited and could have been much shorter. But I think authors, you know, sometimes are encouraged or expected to pad the narrative and extend it and to make it 100,000 words. Uh, because I self publish, <laughs> I can do what I want to do. But I, you know, wrote a graphic novel last year or a couple of years ago and had an editor directly say, if you can add 150 pages, we can talk because then it'll match the spine width of the other books on my shelf in my series. And <laughs> I wasn't willing to do that. So um, yeah, I think there's pressure to create books that have a certain heft to them, like literal heft, how they feel in your hand, how the spines look when they're um, on a bookshelf. Uh, and I think that is of more interest to the sales teams at publishing companies, certainly in the corporate big five, than um, reaching young reluctant readers uh, who need a book that has shorter chapters and fast pacing so they feel a sense of accomplishment as they're reading. Uh, yeah, I think when the audience I have in mind when I'm writing is certainly different than the audience that my publisher has in mind. Thank you so much, Seda. Um, Cherry. Do you have anything to add? I know it's a little bit different for you since you are a graphic novelist, but um, do you have anything else to add as far as, uh, you know, reluctant readers reaching them and, and adding words or pages to your manuscripts? Yeah, I also, when I broke into this, had to kind of emulate a lot of the graphic novels that were out there. Um, I had self-published like Zeta, uh, I also self-published for like 20 years. And uh, the Mama's Boys book that I had self-published as a graphic novel was 96 pages. And I got great response to that. It was a little off-putting to sit down and know that I had to do a 250-page graphic novel. Um, it would be nice in some instances to do shorter and have them more consistent than having them take because it takes like I write them and do the illustrations so it takes sometimes a year a year and a half uh to do it so I do think that there is a market for sure the ones as well thank you so much um uh Jerry Christine and Kaylin I'd like your input as well um Kaylin um yeah I I have um I have had conversations about word count and what that what that means um but for me I I have found that the sweet spot for YA uh, my audience tends to be about 80,000 words it's short enough to where you're not um padding the work um but also long enough to tell a good story I mean the story is as long as it needs to be um or as short as it needs to be I have found that with my um short story work that I tend to that my novels have um, have gotten shorter over time um, because I am kind of uh, working in this space, especially with short stories. I'm trying to put the most impact in the in the least amount of space, um, and then I think that translates over into my my work in in the novel space because um, I'm I'm trying to um, say what I need to say and get it all in there without any filler or fluff. And so um, I, for one, love a shorter novel. I think it 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 just, uh, especially for the YA and middle grade audiences, for those readers, um, it's important for them to be able to have that, that um, like we were saying, kind of that sense of accomplishment and knowing that they can finish something. And um, when you when you have a book that's, you know, five, 600 pages, sometimes that feels overwhelming. And so, um, so I'm, I'm conscious of that. Um, and it is a, a conversation that happens behind the scenes, um, with editors and, you know, in publishing about what it looks like on the shelf and is it going to get lost in the shuffle because it's too short or is it going to be overwhelmingly long? Um, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a strange space, um, to, to create in because you just kind of want to tell the story the way you need to tell it. Um, and then you have all these other kind of all this other input coming in. I hit it from a different perspective. Um, 
in my in my side life, I had been interviewing for MIT. And what I was figuring out is kids who were coming up in both rural and urban areas, by the time they got to 12th grade, were not up to speed with their suburban counterparts in terms of language. And so when I was writing tribes, I was you know, cognizant that I had a prolific reader and a reluctant reader in my house who became a prolific reader. And I was trying to reach gifted kids while balancing it and trying to make the book accessible for little kids. And so we started with a manuscript that was 125,000 words and my editor, um, I, you know, I went to a black publisher, said, um, <clears throat> let's make this 85 and we did, but it still was intimidating. Um, I knew it was gonna be intimidating for reluctant readers. And so what I did was I made the chapter short and I ended them on a cliffhanger because the idea was, to get them emotionally invested in a book. And I got the validation from um, um, a principal at an elementary school who said a teacher was running late. So she took a second grade class and she read a chapter from my book, which is middle grade and it's written high. And she got to the word ballistic because the kid has cut all his hair off and, 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 you know, the dad is horrified because it's a rule in the house. And he says, do you think mom's going to go ballistic? And she said, get with your partner. What does the audience, what, what, what does the author mean by this? And the kids are all whispering. They said, oh, she's going to get really mad to which the principal said, this is an author not talking down to your children. And I said, what I'm trying to do is introduce language and context, but also these other kids have big Harry Potter books and no one's you know, complaining about that. Editors were wanting me to trim this down until I found the black editor. And I said, I'm writing the technical Harry Potter with only kids of color. And it's in its third printing. So um, I think it's not either or, I think it's both. Um, reaching those kids who really need and want a, a thicker book. Thank you so much for um, for those responses. And um, yeah, uh, I, I just hope that at some point, I don't know, maybe publishers should actually talk to children. <laughs> it's just, it always is shocking to me that like, Surprise. no one ever talks to children. Whenever I was, you know, when, luckily, when I was had access to children, I would always ask them what I what they thought. I would get beta readers, like my my honor students that were finished all their work. Hey, can you guys like read a chapter of my book I'm working on? Give me some feedback, you know. And I just I just think that that's so valuable. Those are that's our audience, you know. So and most kids have a lot of opinions. Oh lot. yes, <laughs> and you know what? They're brutally honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's helpful. They don't it is it's anything. Really helpful. exactly, exactly. All right, uh, my next question is, what are the challenges of centering both joy as well as the, ch of the, the struggles of being a black child in an environment that does not um, want to put forth any effort into creating these, these diverse narratives? What are the challenges of creating characters that of course experience quite a bit of joy, but also we have to, they have to have challenges as well. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Zeta. I, sorry, I missed the last part of your question. Oh, okay. I think it was one of the challenges of creating a narrative in which a black child navigates both joy and the challenges of a white supremacist society. Yes, basically, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Okay, um, you know, I get frustrated because that graphic novel that I sent out um, is called The Boy in the Lake. And it's about a young, a teenage girl who moves to Chicago and she goes to the lake. Uh, she's dealing with some stuff at home and she realizes that children who have been murdered in Chicago are living in Lake Michigan with the blue woman who is essentially a, a version of Yemaya. Um, and when we sent, and then, she becomes an initiate and Yemaya resolves the issue of her abuse in her home. Um, and when we sent that out, you know, a couple of editors said, oh, you know, we're not focusing on black trauma right now. We're focusing on black joy. And I just thought, <laughs> so if you didn't see black joy in that narrative, you have a problem and, you know, you are determining 
you know, what children get to read based on your understanding of this binary trauma, joy, trauma, joy. Um, I found that really frustrating, not surprising, but frustrating. Uh, in my books, uh, certainly in the Dragons in a Bag series, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing realistic fiction. It is fantasy, but I'm not doing sort of the elaborate world building that some folks do. I mean, I, you know, my books are set, the first two are in Brooklyn, and then we shift to Chicago. I'm invested in representing um, Black history and incorporating that. I think I'm writing historical fantasy. Uh, and so if you're going to tell the truth, right, teach the youth the truth, then you have to talk about what's happening in society. Um, that doesn't mean you need to hammer anybody over the head with it. I'm certainly not trying to lecture anyone. And with historical fiction anyways, you tend to use only 10 to 15% of your research. So I think in general, you know, the rule is to achieve balance. What I want to do is tell a good story. Uh, and I want to tell the truth. <laughs> And I want to create relationships that children invest in. And so, um, you know, I had my editor initially say, Jack's, Jack's and his mother uh, are facing eviction, not because she doesn't have a job. She works full time. She's paying the rent. But gentrification, you know, the landlord is trying to raise the rent and tear up the building and force them to move out. Uh, and the mother's taken him to court. So she's like, I have to go to court today, Jax. I need you to stay with this old lady, Ma. She's a friend of the family. And Jax has never heard of her. And my editor said, you know, that's too sad. Could you change that? You can't start a book with a, a child facing eviction. And I was like, too sad for whom? Like, which child are you worried about? Because a lot of Black children, a lot of children, period, understand what homelessness is or um, housing insecurity or doubled up housing. I mean, that's a part of life for so many kids, but you know, who are we trying to protect? And didn't Harry Potter, didn't that book start with the murder of his parents while he was in his crib? So, you know, what kind of trauma is problematic and, and what isn't? I think, um, you know, it was, it's, it's always important to me that black children get to be real children. Real children are resilient. Real children laugh and skip and jump and run and play and cry. Uh, the book of mine that's been challenged most is A Place Inside of Me, A Poem to Heal the Heart, which is about a child going through a range of emotions after a police-involved shooting in their community. And the emotion that seems to annoy most white conservative politicians is the Black child expressing rage. I'm like, where's the room for rage in our narratives, right? Like, all of these emotions and experiences deserve to be represented uh, in a way that's realistic and balanced. I'm not going to write a happy-go-lucky sunshine and rainbows book just because uh, I write realistic fiction. And that means we probably do have to address some of the things that impact children and to pretend that the issues that adults discuss endlessly don't impact children is unrealistic. So I'm aiming for balance and truth. But, uh... Excellent. Uh, Jerry, I I'm going to re uh, repeat the question. Um, the question was, what are the challenges of centering both joy and struggle when writing about a Black child in the world, despite an environment that doesn't seem very excited about showing diverse narratives? Well, you know, what's so interesting is that kids uh, accept it, you know, and I was under the notion, you know, I had had it drummed into my head early on that books with African-American protagonists were only for Black readers. Like when I was doing my syndicated Mama's Boys comic strip, it was always like the papers would say, oh, we already have Curtis. We already had Jumpstart. So it's like Highlander where there could be only one. <laughs> you know, and it, it puts us in a very competitive nature because we feel like we're fighting for one or two slots. And one of the things that was so interesting is, you know, I kind of thought that. So when I did New Kid, I thought that, you know, this is my one shot deal. And so I put everything I could possibly put into it. I probably rewrote it a hundred times. And, um, it's now in like 13 languages. So it's so funny that kids love it in Albania. They read it in Romanian. They read it in Spanish, French, and Italian and Greek. They just can't read it in Texas. 
Um, and that is what is so bizarre. But I mean, I literally get pictures of little redheaded girls in Iowa dressed up like this character, Drew, for dress as your favorite character day in school. So it's not the kids at all. Like I've never had an adult say, my, um, my kid was offended by your book. You know, they aren't doing um, focus groups. They aren't talking to kids. They aren't having conversations with the kids. This is, you know, what they, their uncomfortable part of the book that they project onto their kids. And that's why, I mean, when I did New Kid of a, loosely based on my life and my two sons' lives of being one of the few kids of color in a private school, did I expect to be on Don Lemon for being one of the most banned kids' books in the country? It's unbelievable. There's an article on MSNBC the other day that said, why GOP peers fear Jerry Kraft's cartoons. I'm like, who are they talking about? Like, I coach my kids' baseball teams and basketball teams and, you know, go take kids trick-or-treating and stuff and to have them put me as this uh, enemy of the state is just unbelievable. And the last thing is, uh, so one of the, um, the things in the chat, and they talked about uh, trauma. Yes, in every Disney movie, I always say that one of my biggest fears in life is to be reincarnated as a parent in a Disney cartoon because they, they don't make it past literally like half the movie. Right. You know, whether it's Mufasa, whether, I mean, Finding Nemo, he had what, 90 brothers and sisters eaten in the first, you know, <laughs> before the credits went up. And I kept waiting for them to come back at the end and they never did. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that it's okay for Bambi's mother and Jumbo's mother, but if Zelda put something in the book, all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is, I don't know if our kids would be able to relate to that. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, Christine, same question. Okay, so I'm a little counterculture and I'll explain why, and I'm gonna make an apology to Zeta. When George Floyd died, my social media was blowing up with teachers saying, where are the books on how to be an anti-racist and where are the books about civil rights and slavery? And, and I'm married to a guy who's just like the ultimate Zen master. And he was watching me just turn red. And I said, you know what? If you are already suffering from trauma, the last thing you need is well-meaning adults unpacking their own trauma by shoving you full of books about trauma. And so I said, listen, um, I put on Twitter as my response, for every book about trauma, provide 20 books of joy because what we needed was for outside kids to see kids of color as having the same issue. So if my girls are falling in love, it's because they're girls, not because they're black. Not every book needed to be about a cop shooting or not every book had to be about X, Y, or Z. And I go in these inner city schools and they don't know they can be astronauts and they don't know that you can go abroad. So I'm, you know, at the time Skyping my daughter who's living in Italy for 11th grade. And I said, it's not either or, but what ALA and the Coretta Scott King Awards had done was trained publishers to only put out books about civil rights and slavery because those were the ones that would get awards. And I said, so it's not either or, but good grief. My daughter wanted to go to film school. That didn't have anything to do with what is going on in other parts of our life. And so I wanted to balance that tweet got 500,000 hits on the first week and 2,500 retweets. And I ended up on CBS and, and the New York Times. And I said the same thing. We need a balance. And what we've done is we've turned every February into Black Oppression Month. And I said, how about Black Success Month? I just spent my time at Boss Cone um, the weekend with Jeanette Epps, who is going to be flying a Boeing into space next year. You know, I wanted to create pathways so that kids could dream beyond the end of their street. 
And, and, the, and the problem that we have with not having enough people in publishing who are people of color or diverse is that we have the same white gatekeepers who created the problem in the first place, now trying to solve the problem, but not any more educated about it. And I think that's where Zeta was getting the pushback, which is we just want to talk about life, all life. Um, we don't need 10 more books about Martin Luther King and 3,000 more 12 Years a Slave. Um, so that's kind of where I was, is I don't care whether kids go to MIT. I was just hoping to grow a group of students who, when they got to 12th grade, were making choices, not stuck with their defaults by kind of giving them Harry Potter type adventures in which race factors into how they make decisions, but it is not the central source of their conflict and problem solving. Thank you, Christine. Um, Kaylin, did you have something to add? Same question. And Zeta, I can come back to you if you would like to respond to Christine as well. Um, yeah, so I, I think that uh, for me, there is, um, my first novel, um, Cinderella is Dead, was a kind of historical fantasy that centered uh, queer Black girls. It's an all Black cast, but it centered queer Black girls um, kind of living in a, in a heteronormative society and what the expectations are um, of you um, as a queer Black girl living under that type of system, um, those types of issues. But it was a fantasy novel. It was about Cinderella. It was about the kingdom of Cinderella 200 years after Cinderella has died. And um, Cinderella is Black in my book and all of these characters are Black. And so it's it's kind of, um, you know, I understand that there is, there, that there needs to be a balance. I think that uh, the books that we get about joy, the books that we get about trauma, the books that we get about both, it's because we're not a monolith. We, we exist in myriad ways and um, we need books that reflect those experiences. And very much like what Christine was saying, um, publishing has taught readers what to expect when it comes to Black stories and Black characters. Um, and it's not that we don't exist in that way. It's not that we don't need stories that help us navigate um, the brutalities of, of living in a world such as this. Um, but it's that they have kind of taught our readership that is that, that is the only way that we can exist. Um, and I wanted to see a black girl in a ball gown on the cover of a novel. I wanted to see um, uh, in, in my other novels, um, it's contemporary fantasy. And so my characters, again, queer characters, um, all black characters, everyone is, is existing in this fantasy world where they get to kind of discover a secret garden and the, you know, magical powers and they get to be the chosen ones and the heroes and the long lost royalty. And, you know, we, we, we deserve all of those types of stories um, all at once. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I hate that it has to feel like it's either or because we, we can and should have both. And those stories are incredibly important um, for people who maybe don't share our kind of marginalized intersectional identities um, because we need people to see us as main characters as well. It's incredibly important, especially I get to be in community with young people all the time, school visits, um, especially with middle grade students who I absolutely adore. They have no filter. They will tell you exactly how they feel, what their, expect, what their expectations are. Um, it's important for, for all kinds of kids to see queer black kids at the center of a story being the main characters, being the heroes, being the people who get to save the day, being people who experience trauma, being people who are, are well-rounded. You know, we have this, this, um, this human experience and to see us in these, in these roles is incredibly important. And so it's, it's not a question of either or. I think it's, it, has to, it has to be both. It has to be balanced. Um, and we deserve all kinds of stories that reflect all the ways in which we exist. Thank you so much. Zeta, did you want to chime in or are you okay with moving? I didn't think Christine said anything that was contradictory actually. Okay, gotcha. I was saying, right. But I will say that 
you know, when I'm speaking specifically about my book and a number of the anti-racist books that I've seen, you know, for children who are experiencing trauma in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in this country, experience it and being able to heal from it are two different things. So just because children are facing exposure doesn't mean they have the tools that they need and the support that they need to confront and process that trauma. So the subtitle of my book is A Place Inside of Me, A Poem to Heal the Heart. <laughs> so when people are challenging that book, what they're challenging is a resource to help children heal. Uh, you know, social emotional learning was a thing before, you know, it's been around, but it's necessary. We have to have uh, spaces in our community, not only in school, but spaces in our community where we're able to uh, unpack and process and even just acknowledge that we're hurting. So I I don't know what books Christine's reading, but I, I know that there is some, you know, gratuitous violence. And certainly there are editors who are saying, can we add a police shooting? You know, they absolutely are trying to ride that wave and cash in on it. And I'm not just being cynical. I've heard about that. Um, but I think, you know, we need to give kids not simply a representation of reality. Art doesn't just show what's real, it shows what's possible. And art can be therapeutic and it can help children heal. And I think all of us are writing from a place of love. So that's certainly what we're trying to do. Right. And I wanted to chime in and say one of the important things about those kinds of books is um, it's kind of like when I was trying to talk to my kids about you know, the facts of life, and they were hiding in their closet reading the book. Sometimes the safest place for a kid is in the pages of a book, the safest. And, and, and I talk about when you are growing up, you can test theories along with characters in the pages of a book. So if the book is dealing with any kind of trauma or any kind of problem solving, it's, it's a way for kids to process that in a safe place where they can come out whole at the end of the book. My issue with the way publishing works and why I said we got the same plantation trying to solve the problem that they created in the first place, and, and that's what I'm gonna call it, is, um, is because they don't understand this is not a binary choice. This is not either or, it's both. But when we were talking about sci-fi and fantasy, where you can deal with traumatic issues, those are for white kids. And yet when I'm out interviewing, I'm finding whole swaths of kids who don't know. They can travel. They can see the world. They can dream of space. They can dream of other things. And so you look at an article that came out of Europe where it asked kids to write stories, and it's a whole classroom full of kids of color in, in, in England. And they're all white kids in the stories. And they said, well, why aren't you writing about kids that look like you? And they said, well, those kinds of stories are always about white kids. And, and so that's the other thing we're trying to counter is, can I write a book about a bunch of kids on a cul-de-sac who don't know their parents are scientific observers from another planet? And yes, race is going to inform some of the things they're doing, but don't we get, don't kids get to have those kind of epic adventures in addition to what publishers know, I'm sorry, woke white people will buy to fill their libraries up with because they're still feeling guilty about something. I think we need both from really good authors, but the pendulum has swung, I thought, to favor how many more books about Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King and, and Rosa Parks can you write? And I had tuition checks to write it to pay, so I wrote some, but most publishers know don't come to me for those because I'm not going to do any more slavery and civil rights. I'm going to write right. epic adventures. Yeah, see, I agree because I think that, you know, when my kids were in middle school, a lot of the escapist entertainment for their white friends was the Harry Potters and the Percy Jacksons and things like that. And escapist entertainment for Black kids is always escape from slavery, escape from poverty, you know, escape from police brutality. And I always try to add diversity within the diversity. So in my next book, School Trip, they go to the school, the class goes to Paris for a week. And some of the pushback that I already see on Goodreads, which I shouldn't read, but I do, uh, it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, a kid, these kids going to Paris for a week, 
I don't think my kids are going to be able to relate to that. So I'm not going to show it to my class. I'm like, but those are the same kids that you think can relate to a kid who goes to wizard school and flies in the broom and fights dragons and wizards, but they can't see Jordan and Drew going to Paris for a week. You know, and I just want to show that that is something that is obtainable. Like there are lots of black kids and families that make these trips. And if you've never thought of it, then I'd like to plant the seed that you can think of it. It's okay to think of it. You know, like Christine, you just said that they, they said that those kind of uh, stories are only for white kids. They're not, you know. And so that's the kind of thing that I try to, to do in my books. You also gave me PTSD because most people don't know that I left a Cleveland public school to go to Phillips Exeter, which is where Dan Brown went and Mark Zuckerberg went. So when I was reading Jerry's books, I was like, oh my God, I'm having PTSD. But, but the way it was presented was with humor. I mean, you could read that book and it's, it's, it's not only largely hilarious, but I had been hammering librarians in the Kansas City area about Black History Month and the Coretta Scott King Awards. And, and I don't think it was hitting the mark until New Kid came out. And then all of a sudden my social media is blowing up with the spread from his graphic novels where the kid walks into the library and the librarian is greeting them with all of these oppression books. And all of a sudden librarians are going, isn't that what Christine's been talking about? And I was like, yeah, and I gotta go to the hairdresser to cover up the gray because you guys have not been listening for 10 years. Um, so sometimes humor is a great way to hammer the same messages without it being quite as traumatic. Um, but again, I, I believe we need all of these things and, and we need to push publishing to diversify their staff so we can get more of these stories from all sides through. Thank you so much. I know I, there's so many questions. Um, we have eight questions. I know we're not gonna get to them all. And here I thought that I was saving enough time <laughs> to, to get to the uh, Q&A section, but clearly, um, I've not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, hopefully pose two questions and and instead of everyone answering, can we maybe just have one of you answer uh, one of the questions. So this question is from Clarence Young. As writers, do you find it difficult or invigorating to juggle child psychology and imaginary craft in creating work for young readers? And that's up for anyone. Anybody want to take it? <laughs> yeah, I love uh, mixing as much psychology, uh, but also humor and entertainment, because I mean, I grew up in the era where entertainment did educate. So with the, you know, the Fat Albert cartoon always had a message, the uh, Schoolhouse Rock always had a message. And in between the cartoons, there was Time for Timer and things like that, that taught you about healthy eating habits and things like that and Zoom and all that. So I always uh, feel like I need to teach and expand kids' minds, but also doing it in a way that it's still middle grade innocence. I love the middle grade uh, area because it is still innocent. So those are the kind of things that I like to put in my books. So absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, have another question. What advice might you have for black writers in dealing with editors or publishers who say, we've had enough of X type of story? Find a better editor. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Tribes, Tribes had the recommendation of award winning people and peers in the industry. I mean, big names. And we could not get publishers to look at it or consider it. And the ones that did said, you know, this is not realistic because you know, the parents, they have all this unlimited wealth and they're such overachievers. And I said, uh, cause they're scientific observers from another planet and the kids don't know that. And they were like, oh, and I was like, well, wait a minute. So they have to be space aliens before you figure out that it's okay for them to be really smart. And, and what I realized is Jane Yolen, who has written a hundred books, um, but still gets a lot of rejection said, that's the universe telling you, you don't want that person's hands on your book because you don't just want a book on the shelf. 
You don't want to be published. You want to be read and you want to be able to reach the audience you're trying to write for. So sometimes a no is a blessing. Keep finding because they're out there, you know, um, keep searching till you find an editor who not only gets your voice and what you're trying to do, but also wants to develop your career. Because the last thing you want is a book on the shelf that sounds more like your editor than it does like you. And I got Absolutely. really lucky with Tribes. Excellent advice. Um, Kaylin, I'm going to pose this to you. Uh, do you first write to get the story out of your head and then come back after letting the story breathe and then structure the story? Um, essentially, what's your writing flow? What's your process? This is from Tivia Linnell. Um, yeah, so a craft question. I love talking about craft. I could talk about craft all day. Um, so for me, yeah, there's 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 definitely an element of wanting to get the story out. Um, I have uh, I have gone from being kind of a uh, someone who just writes chapter to chapter to someone who now writes from very from a very detailed outline. Um, my process continues to change and evolve over time with each new story. Um, but there's, there's definitely a feeling in the beginning of just needing to get the story down. And what I have learned is, um, that, that, that first draft you is you kind of telling yourself the story and that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be good. It doesn't even have to really make sense. My first drafts are all over the place. They have so many notes and highlights and, voice notes attached my process is kind of all over the place um for that uh for getting the story on paper um and then and then there for me there usually is a period of time where i put it away um and come back to it because once i've gotten everything out and just kind of spewed all of this information onto the page i need a little break um and then i'll come back and start a second pass um, so, so yeah, so for me, the process is constantly changing and evolving. Um, but, um, it's, it, it, there is that need to kind of just tell the story at first. Zeta, what about you and your process, especially with a series? Uh, did you think that Dragons in a Bag was going to be five books? Was it always supposed to be five? Uh, I don't tend to think that far ahead when I'm writing. I wrote the first book and they asked for a sequel and the first book was sort of set up for that. Uh, and then they had two books and I said, are you interested in more? And they said, no. And then they dropped the series and then they came back. And um, I, I never had all five books plotted, but I, I felt as though that was how long it would take to tell the story in a complete way. Uh, for me, writing is 70% dreaming. So I know some folks might look at me and see me on the couch <laughs> watching TV or walking by the lake or hanging out or whatever they see me doing and think I'm doing nothing, but that's actually the bulk of the work. Um, and then, you know, like I wrote Dragons in a Bag in six weeks. So once I've spent enough time with my characters and I hear their voices clearly and I can understand their relationship to one another, their investment in each other, then I make an, a very basic outline, just 10 sentences. And then those 10 sentences become chapters. And then I start writing and I jump around if I need to. I uh, change my ending if I need to. But once you have an outline for me, uh, that's a blueprint and that's that's your roadmap. And that gets you to your destination uh, pretty quickly. Um, I tend to edit as I'm writing. So I'm, you know, like when someone was talking about archives and what they're going to submit to archives to show their process, I'm going to have nothing to show because I edit, I have one document, I don't save multiple versions of the of the manuscript, I just edit as I go so that by the time I get to the end of it, I just got copy edits for book five, The War of the Witches. And it took me maybe an hour to do all the edits. I was like, this used to take days. Like, I don't know what happened, but um, it does get easier, I think, as you write more more books, certainly in a series, because you're just in that world. So you can just send your hammock as a thing that's your creative process. I don't have a hammock, but I should consider that. <laughs> Um, we have another question that I wanted to get to Jerry, because this question is from Lydia McGure, and it's specific to comics. Um, she wants to know about how to, she says rate her book, but I think she means categorize. 
Um, it says, I have a little comic that is a pretty good online following. It grows as the character grows. And because I take my own time making it, so it starts out middle grade as Bonnie as a child, but by the end, it should be very mature. I now have two camps. One wants it to be mature and the other wants it to stay middle grade. So how do I define this to the publishers interested in it? Um, I, you probably do have to choose. I know when I first pitched New Kid, I thought like me, when I went to Fieldston in Riverdale, I went ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. And they said, no, 11th to 12th grade is too old. So it says ninth grade. The biggest push that they gave me was to put Jordan and Drew in seventh grade. And then, you know, I don't think that, although there would be, it might be interesting, I don't think I want to ever have Jordan going to like senior parties, you know, and, and you know, have their drinking and dating for, like in my particular case, I, I want to keep them in that kind of innocent middle grade bubble. And I think most publishers, especially if you're going, you know, like big five will want you to pick, you know, if you're doing the young, happy kind of thing, or if you're doing more of the mature thing, because it's so easy to lose the middle grade readership because now, you know, people will go through and pick one word or one scene from a book and then you've lost, you know, fourth grade through sixth grade because it will never end up in that library. So even it just is for what makes sense and what what's safe, I think you should probably choose one way or the other. Excellent. I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, Okay, uh, Shia, I, don't, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Shia Smith says, isn't the intention of YA novels in part to help young people process the real life challenges they face? I imagine white publishers have issue with subject matter that might reflect their denial thoughts. Anybody can jump in on this one. <laughs> I mean, there's the issue of cultural competence, but there's also, um, you know, publishers chasing trends. And, you know, there certainly are publishers who, you know, just like they say, we want the next Twilight, they want the next The Hate You Give, right? They're just always looking for comps, which is extremely frustrating because why would you be writing something that is identical to something else, right? You're trying to innovate and to write something new. I was on a I, I was on a panel and and someone was trying to define the difference between middle grade and YA and she was talking about you know kids in middle grade don't you know like people of the opposite sex and they think they'll get cooties and I just I said wait hold on hold on I said first off what culture are we talking about because Kids in my neighborhood know a whole lot more probably than the kids in your neighborhood. And I think the problem is, and, and what we've had, what we've spent like decades trying to convince editors about is the kids that we are writing for, that gap that that was not getting served, have completely different experiences than what you might have experienced when you were growing up or what that you're going through with your kids right now. But beyond that, I have cousins in Compton, California, and their experiences were completely different in some ways and similar <laughs> ways to my growing up in Cleveland and my kids were, you know, growing up in Kansas City. So this whole ubiquitous, you know, this is a Black experience or this is an Asian experience or even having Jewish friends saying, yeah, editors think, you know, we all have a dreidel, you know, or is, is, is that's what's mind boggling. And that's why I said, it's really important to start editor shopping. And, but it's also important for us to start pushing back at publishers in terms of who they're hiring in their editorial staff, because YA is not one ubiquitous thing. It, it, it could be a coming of age story, um, but so could middle grade. So could an elementary story. I mean, kids, you know, even adults are constantly growing. I, I think with YA, though, you can get into grittier subject matters mm -hmm. um, in terms of where you're going to get shelved, you know, at or who, which schools are, can pick it up. You can deal with grittier subjects than, than in middle grade. I always say middle grade can be kind of messy and scary, but is ultimately about hope. Um, 
Um, but I, I, I think that the, the biggest impediment to us diversifying publishing is the tendency to try to define one size fits all category. So my advice to the people out there, write your story your way and, and, and life and publishing will figure out where it goes. But if you start writing from a definition point of view, you never get to the heart of what, what, what thing you're trying to, to, to say. So I say sing to your readers and then find an editorial group or a publisher that understands the the language and the words to your song. Wait a minute, Christine, you mean I got my cootie shot for nothing? <laughs> well, maybe not, 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 nothing. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I appreciate it. Somehow we managed to get through all the questions, I believe. So that was fantastic. I am such a fan. I'm inspired by all of you. Again, I have literally at least one book from every single person on this panel. I wish you all so much success. Again, you're inspiring. The the stories you, you tell are, um, they're groundbreaking, they're powerful, and I can't wait for my son, who I know you've seen my eyes shifting, he's over here like in the background, like doing little weird stuff, but anyway, I've like, so please, I've been paying attention, I've also been in mom mode too. Thank you, Zeta. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to all of you who stayed here, and thank you for your wonderful questions, and I appreciate you all. Ms. Moore, do we have a moment for you to tell us about your forthcoming books? Oh, Zeta, no. <laughs> yes. Zeta, you African know mythology. Zeta, you know my book was pushed back a whole year, right? But it's still coming. It's still coming. All it's right. So you're right. You're right. Thanks, Feathers and Folklore, which is the very first um, compendium. It's a field middle grade field guide of African mythological creatures will be released in 2024 from Algonquin Young Readers, and then Fatima's Fantastic City will be released by Harper Collins in 2025. Thank you so much, Seda. <laughs> I appreciate you all, and please enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't wait.